Welcome to the New Testament Review, where every episode we discuss an influential piece of New Testament scholarship. I'm Ian Mills. I'm Laura Robinson. And we're both PhD candidates at Duke University. Today's episode is on the cosmic power of sin in Paul's letter to the Romans towards a widescreen edition by Beverly Roberts Gaventa. And Beverly Gaventa is going to be arguing that we should capitalize the word sin in Romans. This is not a point about orthography. There are no uppercase or lowercase letters in Koine Greek. This is a point about how Paul conceives of sin. And she is going to be arguing that Paul in Romans thinks of sin as a personal agent, as a force with will that does things to people. As opposed to just a literary device or an abstraction to talk about individual specific bad things people do. Right. And sin is a really big motif in the Book of Romans. It shows up a lot. The word sin in the word group surrounding it shows up 81 times in the Undisputed Letters of Paul. And of those 81, 60 of them are in the Book of Romans alone. This is a huge motif in the Book of Romans. Uh, but he particularly talks about sin a lot in Romans 5 to 8. He has 42 uses of the word sin. So the question of how to understand sin is obviously a really big interpretive question for the Book of Romans. And it might seem really intuitive to us. You know, we think we think about sin as a verb, right? Or as a thing that people do. It's very intuitive for us as English speakers to think of sin as, as individual actions that people do that are offensive to other people, that are offensive to God, that are just individual wrong actions. And the question that Gaventa is really pushing on is, is this the best way to understand sin as Paul is using the word? And if not, what does this do to our, our understanding of Romans? Right. I grew up with the Romans road. And the first step of evangelizing someone, walking them down the Romans road, is letting them know that they are sinners. That all have sinned, according to Romans 3, and fallen short of the glory of God. And that means they too are deserving of God's judgment. Similar to the Romans Road is the Four Spiritual Laws. This is a different sort of evangelism tool that shows up in American Protestant circles. The second of the four laws is that humanity is sinful and separated from God, so we cannot know him personally or experience his love. All this is to say, we just have this thoroughgoing idea in many American Protestant circles that sin is a thing that people do that makes them unable to access God or unworthy to access God. It's a it's an individual choice and action that causes problems with your relationship with God. Now, Gaventa is not going to deny that Paul will occasionally use the word sin, the verbs to sin, to refer to things people do that are bad. This is pretty obvious. She is going to argue, however, that we should take a little bit wider view of sin, and we should view those passages in light of Paul's overarching characterization of sin. And in particular, she's going to draw our attention to the fact that sin over and over throughout Romans, especially in 5 through 8, is the subject of verbs. Sin does things. In chapters 5 and 6, sin reigns. In chapter 5, sin enters into the world. In chapter 7, sin seizes opportunity, it produces death, and it dwells. We have this repeated emphasis on sin is a thing that acts in the book of Romans. So both sides of this argument recognize that Paul can use the verb sin to refer to an individual action. And both sides of the debate recognize that Paul does speak of sin as something that acts as a subject of verbs. The question is, is Paul here speaking of sin as the subject of a verb only as a literary device, as a way of personifying something? Or does Paul actually understand sin as a power, a cosmic force, a principle of the universe that acts upon humanity and the world? And she is going to be arguing firmly for the latter. When Gavin 
Atlanta is drawing on this idea that sin is a power. This might not make intuitive sense to a lot of modern readers. Paul is himself a product of the Jewish apocalyptic worldview, right? Paul has a very defined concept of the world as a place that is inhabited not just by God and humanity, but by invisible powers that we can't see, be these angels or demons or demigods or other kinds of forces. When we talk about Apocalypse and Paul, sometimes our terminology can get really confusing really fast because the, the saying that Paul was an apocalyptic thinker is not quite the same thing as the apocalyptic reading of Paul. Uh, the apocalyptic reading of Paul is sort of a modern shorthand for describing a school of Pauline thought that sees Paul as being primarily motivated by... Um, not by some sort of pre-existing feeling of guilt or inadequacy or unhappiness with Jewish customs, but being motivated by a an apocalypse, a central revelation of Jesus as is resurrected. So the the classic figure associated with this reading of Paul is is J. L. Martin. And that's not what we're talking about here. Right. There's some, definitely some kinship and ways of reading Paul here. But the thing that Gaventa is emphasizing the most here is that Paul is thinking of the world as inhabited by by spiritual powers. And this is uh and this is drawn from the Jewish apocalyptic tradition, which refers not just to apo- like to apocalyptic thought as thinking about the end of the world per se, but thinking of the world in terms of spiritual warfare and cosmic struggles between divine powers. So God versus anti-god powers. Sin would be one of these powers. And there's tons of Jewish literature you can go to to see this Jewish apocalyptic view being played out. Uh the Enochian literature famously describes history as a struggle between good and evil, and there are real personal, agential, evil forces that God is waging war with. The closest I think you can find to something like Gaventa's view of Paul's view of sin, and I should note this is not actually in Gaventa's article, but is the Two Spirits treatise from the Dead Sea Scrolls. So there's a lot of apocalyptic imagery in the Dead Sea Scrolls, but this is a particularly interesting tractate that has God setting up two powers over the universe, the power of truth and the power of deceit. And the power of deceit generates individual sins in people. And the word deceit here, showing up in Hebrew, is actually a lot closer to hamartia than maybe the English translation of sin would suggest. Hamartia means something like erring or wandering, and deceit to mislead is a very similar or parallel image. Now, I, to, now, to be clear, I am certainly not suggesting that Paul was reading the Two Spirits tractate. There are good disanalogies between that worldview and Paul's. My point is only that it's perfectly natural to a Jewish apocalyptic worldview to understand the world and human activity as in some way governed by these cosmic personal forces in a non-literary abstract way. That is, it is perfectly plausible to view Paul as a first century Jew understanding sin with a capital S as a thing that's out there doing stuff. We see Paul thinking in terms of spiritual warfare and cosmic struggles in other places in his letters. Uh, one classic example of this would be in 1 Corinthians 15, 24-26, where Paul is describing uh, the end of all things and Jesus' final victory over uh, the powers of sin and death. And he writes, Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. So you can see here that Paul is using this language of cosmic warfare, cosmic reigning, cosmic struggle to describe God the Father is ruling with Jesus over every over things like powers and authorities and rulers. These um you know, these uh, characterizations of invisible forces, right? Likewise, in Galatians four three, Paul says. As with us, while we were minors, we were enslaved to the elemental spirits of the world, to the stoicheia. And while here Paul is probably not referring to death, but to the law, which we're going to talk about more in a bit, we still see this notion of cosmic forces ruling over human behaviors and activities. 
And then finally in Romans 1620, so at the very end of the book of Romans, we have Paul sounding this very apocalyptic note in his sign off uh, when he says that the God of peace will soon crush Satan. So this cosmic warring against invisible powers, this image that constantly keeps coming up in Paul. So Gaventa's article works through Romans uh, sort of chronologically and exposits the text in light of this view. We're going to do this pretty quick and look at whether there are passages in Romans that would might help us adjudicate this question. Does Paul ever actually signal to us that this is something more than a literary device? So sin doesn't actually get named until Romans 3.9, but Caventa argues it's already in view in Romans 1-2, through 2, and we can see that especially strongly when we read that in light of 5-8. through 8. So in Romans 1-2, through 2, Paul argues that Gentiles sin, and the language he uses to describe that is God handing them over to this other thing. And this is already the language of slavery. Then in Romans 2, Paul argues that Jews also sin, even though they have the oracles of God, even though they have the law. And so the conclusion of these two kinds of arguments is Romans 3.9, that all are under sin. The NRSV translates this, all are under the power of sin. The word power doesn't have any corresponding element in Greek, but it is a translation of what's going on here conceptually. That is, Jews and Gentiles alike are under sin. And she suggests what's in view here is enslavement to a cosmic power. In Romans 5, we have death emerging as a twin power with sin, and that sin unleashes death and causes death to spread throughout the world um, as a power in its own right. So in Romans 5.12, we have, Therefore, just as sin came to the world through one man, that being Adam, and death through sin, so death spread to all people because all sinned. Sidebar here, this is of course the famous passage Augustine used to formulate the Western notion of original sin, and that probably is a result of a mistranslation of the Greek, and we can come back to that on, uh, for its own episode. Yeah, yeah. The, the point here is that for, sin, sin is spreading throughout the world, according to Paul in Romans 5, that after Adam sins, this sin power enters the world and starts to spread and take over people, and because sin is doing this, death is spreading as a result of it, okay? And Paul clearly, as we've seen in 1 Corinthians 15, thinks of death as an enemy, as a power, principality, and, you know, force that needs to be crushed. Finally, you get to Romans 7, where I think there's a lot of force behind her argument. It's hard to read some of these passages as anything other than sin as a personal agent. So you can go back and listen to our Stendhal episode, which is our very first episode, about how this fits into Paul's argument. Uh, Paul, we both think, is here trying to vindicate the law by showing that it agrees with our innermost self, which is a kind of a weird-sounding thing, but it's he's sort of walked himself into a corner and has to argue that the law is actually a good thing because we want to keep the law by nature, but don't because sin. Um, so let's look at the particular passages as they bear on our understanding of Paul's notion of sin. So in verse 8, um, sin seizes an opportunity through the commandment and produces in me all kinds of covetousness. So here, sin is taking advantage of something and producing something. But most tellingly is verse 17. Now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Here we have individual sins being assigned to the responsibility of sin, not the individual. And this to me seems like the clearest rejection of the simplistic sin as individual acts alone view. For Paul's argument to work here, you need to accept that sin is something that can act, that can do things distinct from our choice to do them. Because his whole point here is that I don't do this, sin does this, dwelling in me. Why does it matter if sin is a thing that should be understood to be an agent in Paul, that we should capitalize it, we should understand sin to be a power that controls people, versus sin as choices that individuals make that are offensive to God? 
the way you define sin in Romans really determines what you think the heart of Paul's argument and concern is about. If sin is a series of choices people are making against God, then it makes sense to read language like justification and righteousness in Paul as primarily being concerned with the issue of forgiveness or imputation of a righteous status to people. That people have this sinful status before God because of the choices they made, the things they have done, and God gives them righteousness or he gives them forgiveness and uh, and that is the thing that solves the problem but if we see sin not as a thing people are doing but as a thing that is enslaving people then we get a much more different understanding of what salvation is in Romans. And for Gaventa, it's not really about forgiveness, or it's not really about imputation of a righteous sta uh, status. It's about deliverance and liberty from this power that is causing people to sin and die. Right. It moves how we understand words like justification, which are obviously central in Romans, away from the imputation of a righteous status, like Laura said, or forgiveness, and towards a sort of rectification of the human person. Sanders translates it to, to right-wise. Right wise. Yeah, yeah. It shifts the heart of Paul's theology away from the more forensic realm to the more liberative realm. How does God liberate us from, capital S, the power of sin? Thank you, Ian. Yeah, thanks, Laura. All right. Bye.